talk about the household. Right? What does God have to say about the household? So we kind of introduced the topic last week, uh, talked a little bit about um, how the household certainly is under attack and all the rest. I'm not going to go through all that today, but I want to talk a little bit about um, what we find in Genesis chapter number 2. Let's just go ahead and turn there to start. Genesis chapter number 2, we find the account of God making man. So we looked at Genesis chapter number 1 last week, talked about how it's kind of a um, an overview of all of creation, right? So you have to really understand Genesis 1, then Genesis 2 uh, builds on that and points back to Genesis 1, but it goes into greater detail about the creation of man specifically. So God making man in his own image, uh, and he creates him, puts him on the earth in the garden that he had planted. Uh, and he tells the man before he had created a, a help for him. He had put the man in the garden and said, hey, do this work. And he was told to dress it and to keep it. Those are two very distinct charges that God gave the man concerning uh, the garden. So to dress uh, literally just means to serve or to work. Right? So man was to work the garden. He was supposed to uh, dress the garden. So he's going to serve and work. And by virtue of fulfilling this task, he would be, in fact, doing service to God himself because God was the one who had commanded it. And as we've continued to reiterate, if God has commanded anything, it's because it's what's good for us. Right? So work is a gift. Work is a blessing. Uh, but work being done alone... Um, can be a curse, right? So whenever we look at what God does through the, uh, the last day of creation and creating man, we're all familiar with the fact that he says uh, that it's not good, right? It's the first time we have in the creation account that God looks at something he had done. Now, this is, again, just taking an understanding of who God is. It's not like God was thinking about it as it was happening and just saying, you know, this... I, I need, to, I need to do something else. What, sh what else should I do? But what he's doing is he's uh, narrating for us uh, the things as they happen in time. So when God looks at something uh, and says it's not good that man should be alone, uh, then we understand from that that it doesn't mean that God didn't know what he was going to do, but he's telling us something. Right? He's taking the opportunity to tell us something about what he's doing. So God says it's not good man should be alone. I'm going to make a help that's meet for him. Uh, he causes uh, Adam, of course, puts him into a deep sleep. Uh, and then he brings forth from his uh, rib the woman uh, and all the rest. So I, I think that's kind of where we left off last week. Uh, it was kind of in verses number 21 of chapter number 2. It says, And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So we have right here in the very uh, earliest days of, cre of creation, at the foundation of the world, at the very outset, God lays forth a pattern of how households are to work, right? And so he uh, creates man, and then from the man he creates woman, and it's in the union of these two that, be our, that are one that we have the idea of household. So a couple of things that I want to uh, reiterate, and we'll get into this maybe a little bit more particularly in future lessons. But the word that's used for help here, when God says that he's going to make a help for Adam, this is not the word assistant. Right? When God made a help for Adam, he's not saying I'm making uh, someone to be an assistant for you. Someone to, um, you know, that you can have do all the stuff you don't want to do. This is, what we have is, a union of male and female into one, right? And so this is, this is one flesh, one body. 
It's a union that God makes. And we're going through uh, marriage counseling with a young couple and uh, reiterating to them the fact that marriage is something God does that we're called to recognize. But it's an act of God. It's a union of God. And the Lord even said what God hath joined together. Right. So when we make those vows, right, we, we think we're just inviting all of our friends uh, to come together and to celebrate with us. And in fact, that's a piece of it. But the reality is that they are gathered there as witnesses of the oath that we are taking to God, that I'm vowing to him to love this other person. Right. Which which entirely is distinct and separate from vowing to them to love them. No, I'm vowing to God to love this person. That's what marriage is. And so we gather before God and men as witnesses to the oaths that we're making, that regardless of what the other person does or says, we're vowing to God, we're taking this oath upon ourselves. And so uh, within that oath, that should be a very sober thing, right? I mean, it's a very uh, important thing. And so over and over again, what I want to drive at this morning is that this idea of the household and looking back to the pattern, this is what we said last week. It's interesting. If you go to Matthew chapter number 19 or Ephesians 5, you have the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul using this initial pattern as the basis for the household, which is a pre-fall basis, right? This is pre-fall. This is looking back to what it was like before sin entered the world uh, through Adam. And so before all that happened, this was the pattern that God had made, that there would be a man and a woman, and that they are joined together. And in this, we see kind of the idea of houses, right? That the woman is an ally, which is the uh, correct understanding of the word help. The same word that's used of help in Genesis 2 of the woman is the same word God uses of himself, when describing uh, himself as a help to his people, right? It's an ally. It's someone who uh, literally surrounds. And we find this idea in scripture a lot that the woman is kind of a, a completion of the man, but also kind of a, uh, a type of a home for the man in that she is to be uh, the fulfillment and satisfaction of all the man's needs. And in we see this back and forth in several places in Scripture that the man uh, is the covering of the woman, but also the woman is kind of the, the place of refuge for the man. And what are we to understand from that? It's, it, it's in very, uh, very clear terms, I guess, that the woman is to be for the man, the one to whom he goes to have his needs met. Right? What does the world want to do? It wants... In, uh, Solomon goes at great length to talk about this, about how uh, the woman whose roots go down to hell is to entice the man to sin, right? To draw him out with cords uh, of iniquity and to lead him to the slaughter, right? So the eyes of a man looking on a woman to lust after her, a woman to whom he is not joined in marriage, to lust after that woman, to be drawn away from what God has instituted which is that he is supposed to look upon his wife, right? That her nakedness is his nakedness, that her body is his body. And so the woman is a covering for the man's eyes, so to speak, and a protection and a refuge uh, so that uh, he can enjoy the things of creation as God uh, gave them to be enjoyed, right? There is something uh, that is to be enjoyed in marriage as it relates to, uh, you know, those uh, sexual relations that are, are ordained of God to happen in the marriage union. Uh, but apart from that, it becomes iniquity, right? It's outside of God's intent. It's outside of his ordained uh, creation purpose. And so similarly, Sarah and Abram uh, are also demonstrate this in a way in scripture. And it's pointed out for us in the text of scripture that Abram was a covering for Sarah in that uh, other men desired Sarah because she was beautiful to look upon, didn't they? However, Abram was a covering for her. In other words, the fact that she was joined to Abram uh, meant that she's off limits to everyone else. Right? And so uh, Abimelech and Abram went through this whole scenario together, didn't they? 
uh, when Abram kind of concealed the fact that they were married. Uh, and then Abimelech, or, or one of his men, he even says, might have lightly lied with her, or, or they might have taken her to themselves, um, not knowing that she was actually given to Abraham and joined to Abraham. And it would have been a great sin in the sight of God. And Abimelech even knew that. He understood this is a great sin that uh, it leads to a pollution of the land. Now, if you think about America and our time today uh, and think about how greatly polluted the land is, uh, just imagine what God sees when he looks at the world and he sees the condition of men uh, and he has an understanding of, of how great a pollution it is for a woman uh, to be joined to one man and then to leave him and be with another man or a man to leave his wife and take another woman and, and all this stuff that flows out of the hardness of men's hearts, right, that the Bible says greatly pollutes the land. So in all that, we see that the woman is an ally that is a help to the man and that also the man is a, a fortress and a defense for the woman. In other words, through the union of these two, God has established a new household, a new house. When we think of a house, we think of a place of refuge. It's where you go to get away. It's where you go to rest. I mean, primarily the, the home is thought of as a place of rest. Now, granted, there are chores and there are things that have to be done to, for the upkeep of the home. But generally speaking, the home is a place of retreat. Right? It's a place of refuge. And that's what a home is intended to be by God. And a city, when we think about the idea of a city, we touched on this last week, has the idea of a community of households. Right? So we might have a household that is a man and his wife and children. And then as children leave the home and are joined to a spouse and become their own household, this now becomes a community of households that are in fellowship. And of course, we see that most clearly defined in uh, the New Jerusalem, which is the city that God built, right? So we're looking for that community of households that we'll be uh, joined to. Uh, most of the time, and we may talk about this some other time, but cities in Scripture um, from the very beginning have bad connotations, right? Uh, from the very beginning of time, as far as if you go back to Babel, it talked about the city which the sons of men did build. Right, which is, stands in stark contrast to the city that God built. So we have a city that men are building and a city that uh, God has built. All of those things are important. So as it relates to our understanding of the household. So let's move on from there. I just wanted to point out that this foundation in Genesis 2 serves as a reminder and a pattern for us today because even Christ and the Apostle Paul continue to point us back to say, this is where it started. This is how it was founded. And so we need to understand God founded it. It's something he does. Men do not have the power to disannul it. However, they can do much to harm it, destroy it, and tear it down, which is what we find oftentimes taking place. So let's look at the word uh, house in scripture. I want you to turn just a couple pages over to Genesis 7. because I want to get a little bit of a, of a context of how the word house is used in Scripture. In Genesis 7, verse number 1, the Lord said unto Noah, what does he say? Come thou and all thy, what? House into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, this is where, again, the patriarch is the one that defines the household and here we also see that Noah and his sons already have taken wives, but they're still re referred to as the house of Noah. We see this clearly with the tribes of Israel too, don't we? That we have the 12 tribes of Israel. And so you had the house of Levi and the house of Naphtali, the house of Judah. All these things, they're always referred to as houses, right? So this is a structure uh, is what kind of comes to mind for us, but the way God views it, it's members that are joined together into this house or this what we might call a family. We still kind of use the word household, um, but not probably as much anymore. Mostly what you hear is the word family, and that's okay. It carries kind of the same idea. 
But the root, the word that uh, is used all through the Old Testament that uh, is translated as house is taken from a root that means to build. Now that might seem obvious at first glance, but it's, with a little contemplation, it's important to understand what's being said. House is taken from a root that means to build. If I ask you, hey, I want you to help me build something. The most immediate, uh, there are a number of questions that come into mind, but the most immediate connotation that that carries to your ears is what? It's going to be some work. I mean, if anybody ever asked you to build something and you didn't first think, do I have the energy for this? I don't know. I don't know if I'm uh, up to building. And then you may not even know what it is yet you're being asked to help build. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it brings to bear the idea of work. There's work involved. Right? Things don't get built. I've, I've said for a long time, destroying is easy. Any fool can tear stuff down. Any fool can tear stuff down. It takes no skill. It takes no understanding. It takes no uh, discretion. It takes no deference. It takes no wisdom at all to tear stuff down. Right? I mean, it's just, you can turn just about anybody loose uh, and say, hey, I want you to help me tear this down. And, and you can find anybody from the smallest child uh, to the oldest person who's never done any of that work and just say, we're going to tear this down, and they can contribute. They can make contributions. It's easy. So we see with this word a couple of things brought to bear. Effort is the most probably prominent in our thinking, but additionally, what is necessary to build anything? It takes wisdom. It takes understanding. It takes skill. It takes time. It takes patience. And all that has to be combined with effort. Effort is not in and of itself enough. Right? Tearing down also takes some measure of effort. But it doesn't take skill or wisdom or understanding. When it comes to building a house, and so the Bible says, if the Lord doesn't build it, they labor in vain. And Christ even used the same thing about, are you building on the rock or are you building on the sand, right? A lot of effort and everything going in either way, but one builder had understanding, right? One builder had wisdom. One builder had skill. So the other things that might come to mind with the idea of building is, of course, you need a, pat you need a pattern. You need some kind of a floor plan. You need something to go off of. Uh, you know, Adam has recently built a home. Uh, one of the first things that he probably did when engaging a builder, once he decided who he's going to use, and he might have already been thinking about this already, but one of the first things that comes to mind is what? The plan. What kind of a building do we want? And, and ultimately, to make the best choice that he could make about what kind of a building do we want, the thing that is brought to bear in our mind is the needs of the people who will live there. This makes a great church, but it wouldn't make a good home. The structure is altogether unsuited for that purpose. Now, could you make do? I mean, you keep you out of the weather, you could make do. But it's not well suited for the purpose Right? So if Adam's going to build a home, he has to know for his home something about the people living there. Right? And, and say, okay, we're going to build a home. The, the first thing that's necessary to understand is what about the people living there? This is the exact same way that we see God thinking about creation, if I can use the word thinking. Um, this is how God approaches creation. Before he creates man to put him in the earth and in the garden, what had he already done? He had provided the place necessary and made sure that everything was put together in a way and in a fashion 
that would support and, and be suitable as a place for men to dwell. Say, I'm going to create a place that's suitable for men to dwell, and then I'm going to create man and put him there. And that was the final and last thing he did. A lot of parents miss this in building a home, and we're going to talk more about this uh, down the road. I don't want to get stuck here this morning. A lot of parents miss this, right? Because a lot of parents just, the children are kind of an ancillary part of the function of the household. Uh, they're there to help you get chores done, um, or they're there to, we're not sure why, whatever reason uh, any parents may have about children in their home. But the ultimate purpose is that the parents are responsible for mirroring what God did in the beginning. The parent's job is to create the environment and the place that's suitable to meet the needs of those that are going to dwell in that house and that they might be uh, given opportunity, every opportunity, to thrive and excel and succeed by having all their needs met, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually, not necessarily in that order. But it kind of starts there when they're young. And I think that's a grace God gives that your children's physical needs manifest themselves before their emotional needs and their spiritual needs so that you as a parent can grow into being a parent because we don't know how to be parents because we're very selfish. So God gives us babies. Babies don't have spiritual needs. The babies don't have emotional needs. They have physical needs. And as such, parents are given the opportunity to learn to give of themselves to meet the needs of those children and to foster uh, an environment that is healthy for them by learning to die to themselves and meet the needs of their child so that by the time the child has emotional needs which will happen before they their spiritual needs are manifest they will have emotional needs and you hopefully have grown as a parent so that you are prepared to meet the emotional needs of your child by giving of yourself being sensitive to what's happening in their world and working with them as they grow. And then by the time their spiritual needs manifest themselves, hopefully you've made that same journey. Does anybody feel like you grew up with your kids? It's because in fact we do. And it is a grace that God gives that we do in fact kind of grow up with them because we've never done a lot of this either. Maybe you were the oldest sibling and you have some experience with younger siblings, but it's, it's entirely different than being a parent who's chiefly responsible. So the parents are joined together, they create the world in which the children are placed, and then they learn to give of themselves to meet the physical and the emotional and then ultimately the spiritual needs of their children. So this, this word house has everything to do with that idea of building and, and wisdom and understanding. If you turn over to the book of Proverbs 14, I'll show you a couple of places in Scripture where we see this spoken to, and then we'll move past the point. But I think it's an important point, probably one that we could spend uh, more time on. Proverbs 14, verse 1. Every what? Wise woman buildeth. Okay, so here we see Solomon tying all these ideas together. That there is wisdom and understanding that's necessary to engage in the work of building. At least building anything that's worthwhile. But notice the contrast. We see the word but, right? So this is an antithetical parallelism. And a lot of times if you see the word but, that's kind of a giveaway that that's what's at play. He says, every wise woman does what? Buildeth her house. Now, is he saying that uh, that it's the woman who's supposed to go out to the garage and get uh, the hammer and the nail apron and climb up on the roof and, and put the shingles back in order. And that's not what he's saying at all. He's clearly talking about the, the house of the family, right? And he's speaking, uh, interestingly, to the woman being the builder of it, which is an idea we see actually all through Scripture, that the woman is the builder of the house. It's by the woman that God brings forth the seed of the man. 
And so she literally is the builder of the house. We see in the book of Ruth um, that we see uh, Leah and Rachel spoken of that way. And we'll, we'll get to that another time. Um, so let's, let's stick with this here. Uh, my mind was tracking there for a minute. But well, notice what it says. What's, the, what's the, the antithesis of a wise woman who builds her house? It is the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. Now, there's a lot of things Solomon has to say about the house, but what he's calling our attention to particularly here is the role of a wise woman or a foolish woman. A wise woman builds her house, builds it up, right? It takes effort. It takes wisdom. It takes understanding. It takes uh, a will. And I, I say wisdom Wisdom is obedience to God. If we could just draw a real clear line in that, uh, that, that wisdom is to do things the way that God has said they ought to be done. So she builds her house, but the foolish woman plucketh it down with her hands. So we have a real clear opposite about the household and how it's either built up or it's torn down. Uh, if we go over to Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, verse number 18. By much slothfulness, the building, what? Decayeth. When you think about decay, there's forces at work all the time that lead to decay. And in order to counteract all the decaying forces of this natural world, effort must be applied right there's there's a natural sense of decay in other words there's no point at which your house uh is is complete and you can just sit back and it will just remain as is uh, i've known a lot of people who have had their their house in order at one season of life and it seemed as if everything was well only to find themselves in another season of life and all of a sudden everything is falling down around them what's happening well we get a little bit of a view to that by much slothfulness slothfulness is the opposite of diligence and it's driven and motivated by the spirit of a person who wants to satisfy or please themselves if you are slothful, you will not do the things that duty requires if it is uncomfortable or inconvenient to you, right? You're unwilling to do it because, for the simple reason, I don't want to. That is the motto of the sloth. I don't want to. And what we're ultimately left to believe by a person who embraces that motto is that the highest standard in life that they can know is a line that is drawn somewhere. Or there's a threshold of what they want to do. And when they say, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that, what we're expected to take from that and to be okay with is that that's the highest level of truth that does exist in the world is that somehow when we say, I don't want to, that that is a license uh, that basically grants us the liberty to sever any ties to our responsibility just because we've said, I don't want to. So the slothful is always motivated by the idea of I, what I want to do and don't want to do, and the things I want to do will get done, which ultimately is the way the world works. The things all of us want to do get done and the things we don't want to do go neglected. But how is it that the house comes to decay? Well, it's by much slothfulness, right? Much slothfulness. You're just ignoring uh, all those little things. You start seeing little problems in the family, and they go neglected. A little sarcasm, uh, a little backbiting, 
Uh, your children come to you with, with their problems. Uh, I don't have time right now. A little brushing them aside uh, and, and just leaving them to fend for themselves and navigate the waters of life on their own without the benefit of your guidance, which is the whole reason that you're in the family to begin with, is to give them the benefit of your experience and guidance. So we brush them aside. We tell them uh, they're the ones with the problems. They're the ones with the issues. Uh, all the while, all of that starts at the head and works its way into the family, right? So the, the father is chiefly called upon, but the, the parents together as one flesh to be diligent in the management of their household so that if you start to see things begin to develop, a little roof leak here, a little something over there, what are, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to take those mitigating measures in the moment, right? Then we see things are not working well, then what we need to do is engage, right? Not just ignore. Or even worse, do things that make it, uh, we, we take harmful measures that actually rip the little leak into a gaping hole, and then we, we blame the others that why is there all this water all over the floor the next time there's an, a storm? Well, it's because you did nothing to help. Uh, I, hear, I hear parents too often utter phrases to their children, uh, I think trying to help them cope, and they're saying things like, nobody cares. So what have we done? Have we built anything? Or are we just tearing stuff down? It's obvious, the answer, even though it may be uncomfortable. But if you have a child come to you with a problem and your response is, nobody cares, you just need to deal with it. Then what have they learned? Nobody cares. And I'm not going to them with anything ever again if I can help it. They're the last person in my life. We wonder why so many children grow up and they gravitate to uh, their friends and they gravitate to their coaches and their teachers and they're reaching for people outside the home. It's because they have not been embraced by those in the home. Not been embraced, right? With an affectionate desire to see them succeed. Right? When they come to you with a problem, instead of brushing them aside and saying, nobody cares, just, you know, it's almost like we're annoyed that they have an issue. Right? Well, how do you want your Heavenly Father to treat you when you cry out to Him? You want Him to be annoyed at you because you have an issue? <laughs> or do you want Him to stop and listen and help? Be a help, right? So this is uh, the thrust of what we're talking about as it comes to the home. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. Idleness of the hands. A lot of times we think the house is, the problems with the house are that other people aren't doing X, Y, and Z. That's not what the text says. It says you need to do something. I don't know how often this happens in homes. Uh, and you hear it often that the people in the home, uh, usually the parents, although this, this spreads to the children and becomes the philosophy of the household itself, because really the culture of the home is set by the parents. The culture of the home is determined by the parents themselves, and the children learn to operate within the culture that you create, right? I mean, you've got to know that right up front. We'll spend some time talking about that another time. But he's saying that idleness of the hands. We often want to say the problem with the house is that they won't, or my kids do this, or my husband is that way, or my wife, if my wife would just, X, Y, and Z. None of those things are helpful. What's really needed is that you decide and determine to get involved with building the home. Building the home. Not tearing it down, building it. And if, if one person in the home 
decides to take that course of action. He says, I'm going to determine to build up this home. God will bless that. He'll bless that. I didn't say it'll be easy, but he will bless that. And you're going to have to, in a certain sense, you have to die to the idea that my husband will ever be on board or that my wife is ever going to do things X, Y, and Z or my children are. All of those things will be worked out by who? If the Lord doesn't build the house, us trying to control everyone else is not going to build the house. It will tear it down. The Lord must build the house. I, I want to share with you a story that sounds self-serving, but it's just, it's my life, so it's all I know to, I have, what I've got to work with. This is, I'm bragging on the Lord, and I'm bragging on my children. It certainly doesn't have anything to do with me, but it was not too long ago that, um, you know, I'm, I'm blessed in this regard. Whenever, whenever I come home from work, I've got five daughters from 17 down to five, and every one of them still run to the door. Uh, to welcome me into the, the door when I get home from work at the end of every day. They want to kiss. They want to hug. They want to tell me about what they've been up to. Um, and, and even from the oldest right on down, they still all want to run to the door. Well, a few weeks ago when I was passing out the, the books on charity, I wanted to bookmark all of those, uh, the same page and all those books. And my children found out I was, I was a few bookmarks short. And I never said to them, you know, Everybody drop what you're doing. I've, I've got to have bookmarks. They just saw that I was looking for bookmarks. And all five of my children immediately quit doing what they were doing and began scouring all of their own personal books, looking for a bookmark so they could help dad. So why is that meaningful? Because I didn't ever say... I want you guys to stop everything you're doing and help me find bookmarks. Finding bookmarks was my problem, not theirs. And I wasn't going to make it their problem. I was working through finding them myself, and I was scouring my own books, trying to find enough bookmarks to mark everybody's book. But they saw what Dad was up against, and they jumped in. So why is that important? Well, I'm afraid we may not have time uh, to get to it this morning, so we'll have to leave it for next week. But I want you to understand that if God isn't doing the work in the other people in the family, then it's not going to get done by you. What is needed is for each individual to die to the, the idea that I can make everyone else do this this way, and we need to live unto God by dying to ourselves and say, I'm going to do my part his way. He will bless it. Your home will be blessed. But you've got to have this notion that God is working not just in me. He's working in the heart of my wife. He's working in the hearts of my children. He is the one who is working to build us up together. Our job, we do have some responsibilities to him but if the Lord isn't doing the other part, it's all a waste of time. So how do we co-labor with him in that? Is it becomes really the important thing. What does wisdom require of us? Well, we've seen some things. It requires wisdom. It requires diligence. Uh, it requires effort. It's not slothful. And it's not idle. Right? So all of that sets us up for maybe where, where we're going next week. I find it really interesting, uh, but I, for time's sake, I've got to stop right there. So we'll be dismissed for this morning, and we'll, we'll pick it up there again next week.